Um, today I want to talk about some of the latest and greatest stuff in Flink. Um, I'm going to go over a few things sort of quickly, but I just want to cover them. And then we're going to leave a pretty good chunk of time at the end to actually develop or go through and sort of demo an interesting Flink application. Um, so yeah, that's what we're going to do today. Let's get started. Okay, so I work for Data Artisans. I'm the Director for Applications Engineering. What that means is that basically my mission every day is to make sure people are successful with Flink. So that implies a lot of things, but that's really what I care about every day. Um, Data Artisans is, uh, Data Artisans is a company formed around Flink. Some of the original creators of Flink um, uh, at the Technical University of Berlin, sort of some of the early founders got together and formed a company and then some other people joined and uh, now we're about 20, 21 people. Um, and we provide a product called DA Platform, which is basically a commercial distribution of Flink. You start to see sort of that platform evolve into something larger, um, basically something that allows you to adopt stream processing in your company and really solves the problem end to end. Um, but for now, DA Platform in its current version is a commercial distribution of Flink that you can get 24-7, 365 support for. Uh, and there's more to come. The, um, so some of the latest features we're gonna cover, this is just the quick overview. There's a couple new things. One of them is called process function, which is sort of a, I would say it's sort of more of a low, lower level API in Flink, but not really low level. Like it's uh, still, Basically, it's the core function that allows you to just process, consume events, update data structures that Flink manages fault tolerantly for you, schedule things to happen according to a processing time or event time, and then emit results either as input is, uh, arrives or at some time in the future. So basically, it's the primitive that allows you to more or less build anything you can build um, with the core Flink technology. On top of process function, you can think of it as kind of like the lowest level in the API, and then there's several things built on top. For example, the normal data stream API, uh, which has kind of a nice fluent API, and then there's uh, the table API, and then there's streaming SQL on top of that. Um, we're also gonna talk about queryable state, which is something that's, I would still say in Flink 1.2, it's, it's available and it's useful, but it's, I would say it's experimental. So, um, really, the, the level of maturity for this is it's, it's pretty young and it doesn't allow you to, it allows you to query Flink from the outside world, right? Look up, query the state that's inside Flink, but in the current version, it's not highly available. So it's only available when your job is running, right? So even during sort of like machine fails and there's recovery, during that same period that your job's recovering, the, you can't service queries either. So that will change in the future, but currently it's, that's the case. Um, the combination of these two things really allows you to provide excellent support for advanced, what I call advanced applications. These things are uh, flexible, stateful, event-driven, and time-driven. And it sort of pushes, I think, forward the, the notion of what stream processing is all about. It's much more than like, I think classically, or stream processing has sort of been applied to analytics primarily, and this is really nothing like that. This is really just event-driven applications, which is a very broad scope. The other thing I wanna talk about, I should have put these in the other order because I'm gonna talk about these first, is the following. These are all sort of new in um, Flink as of now. So we have rescalable state, which we'll just briefly cover. Async IO support, which is something really nice for people building real um, systems. Um, it's just like nice practical support so people don't have to keep rebuilding the same stuff over and over again. So I'll go into some detail on that. Uh, we also have some, I just want to point out some of the newer deployment options with Flink and some security enhancements that are also there. And some of these other things will be talked about in great detail in other talks, so I'm more or less going to skim over them and get to what I really wanted to talk about, which is the first slide. Um, rescalable state, for those Flink users in the room, you know that prior to Flink 1.2, Flink's always managed state for you and always has had sort of fault tolerant state as in part of the stream processor, but the problem was that once you were running a job with a certain parallelism, you couldn't relaunch the job with a new parallelism and keep all the state intact, right? So the reason this is important, or what you can do now is exactly that. You can, um, 
you can have your job running with, say, parallelism of 100, and you can stop the job with a save point, and you can restart with a parallelism of 200, and Flink will appropriately reassign all the state to the right tasks. And it, it does so very efficiently without having to move anything, but you can think of it as Flink just knows how to repartition your data, so you can scale up and down. So that's a new feature in 1.2. It's the it's sort of the basis for auto scaling. You had to have this first, right? So now you can already, with a little bit of tooling around this, you can scale Flink up and down as needed. But you have to poke it from the outside. Flink doesn't internally elastically scale. But if you already have scaling policies, you can poke it from the outside and say, hey, scale up, scale down. And Flink can do that now. Um, graphically, what does this mean? You start with a job that's super simple. You want to scale up. You've got this state. This is the hard part, is you've got the state in the blue boxes. Um, this is like, think if you're doing distributed counting or something like that. It's the, it's the count for all the keys, right? It's whatever state you happen to have. And as you scale up and down, Flink needs to be able to reassign all that state to tasks so you can make use of more machines. So this is all, this scale up, scale down stuff is now possible in Flink. It's pretty cool stuff. There's not much more to say about it than that. You can scale up and down. It works. It's great. OK, so flexible deployment options. You can now deploy. Yarn is not, nothing new. You've always been able to deploy on Yarn really seamlessly. We've also got support for Mesos now. So Flink is, um, in Flink 1.2, There's Flink can run as a Mesos framework. There's always been other ways to run on Mesos, but Flink can run as a Mesos framework now, which means Flink itself can actually request resources from Mesos to acquire more machines, more resources. Um, there's been some tooling to make it work really well on Docker in various, it could be Docker Swarm, it could be on Kubernetes, it could also be Docker on Mesos. But basically, there were some issues in the past, um, mostly centered around some of the networking in Akka that made it a little bit hard to deploy Flink with Docker the way you'd want to. You could always do it with host networking, but now you can do it um, the way you'd expect things to work in a, in a containerized world. And it also works quite well on Kubernetes. Um, more deployment options, um, just kind of pointing out that there's been specific work done by other vendors to make Flink work really well. So Mesosphere's DCOS, Amazon EMR. If you have, Amazon, if you have an Amazon EMR cluster, you have Flink. Um, there's also some tooling in Google Dataproc to also get Flink up and running really quickly in these environments. So that's really nice, makes it easy. Asynchronous I.O. support. This is a little bit meatier topic. So what this is basically is the following. So actually, let's start with the diagram. Typical streaming job, just in real, in the practical world, building systems, you find that like some part of the data flow needs to talk to an external service. It might be a REST service. It might be a database. Um, but the gist of it is there's some service over there it's got sort of higher latency response, and you still want to like run your streaming job with good performance at high throughput, but you've got this thing in the way. So if you just did simple like for every input message, you made a call to, in this diagram, Redis, and then waited for the response and continued, your throughput would just like go through, you know, go to the floor. So the solution to this typically is to make, uh, essentially make async requests to those external services and keep a bunch of them in flight at the same time. Right? The reason this works is basically because of Little's law. This is the relationship between throughput and latency. There's something in the middle there called occupancy or capacity. Basically what that means is the way you get around this is you keep a bunch of requests in flight at the same time. Right? So if your latency increases by tenfold, if you keep 10, more, 10 times more requests in flight at the same time, you get the same throughput as before. So that's basically what we uh, enable with async IO is to just to, to properly do this so that you can keep lots of flights and requests at the same time. Um, so yeah, efficiently keeps configurable number of asynchronous calls in flight. You, you configure the number that you would like. The other thing is when you get into trying to build this yourself, it gets tricky pretty quick in the face of faults, right? So you have to, you have to track the right things in Flink state, coordinate to some degree with the, the way checkpoints and recovery works. It gets a little bit complicated to do it exactly right. So rather than having everyone building this stuff, we figured let's build an operator into Flink that does this for you. So it's pretty nice. Um, 
another depiction of why you need to do this. On the left is synchronous I.O. All that orange is wait time. The way you get around this is to keep a lot of flights and request, or sorry, a lot of requests in flight at the same time. Um, another, this is grabbed from the design docs for this feature. I'm not going to go through all this. The point of this slide is actually to say, look, to get this right, it's actually fairly complex. If you go and read the design docs uh, around this, the implementation of this, uh, it's it's kind of it's it gets fairly complicated. But the nice thing is you don't have to worry about any of that. And it's as easy to use as this. So you have a data stream. You have some, um, let's see, this thing at the bottom, async data stream, wait. Essentially, there's that thing, async database request, the async function. You write one of those. That does something that's either uses a thread pool because it's slow, or better yet, actually does async as well. So like imagine like, an async call to Cassandra that returns a future. You just write that simple function there, and Flink does the rest. The timeout's a timeout, and the concurrent request is really the number of calls to keep in flight at once. So that's as easy it is to now do this, and at the end of all this, after the wait, you just get a normal data stream back, right? And it just works like normal in Flink. And this is what it looks like if you wrote one of these async request functions, right? So it's also really simple. This would be where you'd make the call to Cassandra or Redis or whatever. And you get a future back, you wait on the future, and then you have this collector interface, which is just really familiar to Flink users that have ever written like a flat map function or something, you get a collector. So that's it. And all that other, all that other stuff is kind of handled by Flink now. So it's, it's really nice and it's super practical because this comes up all the time when you build systems. You've got other systems you have to talk to. All right. Um, let's see. Security. So new in Flink 1.2 as well, there's SSL support. So that's basically to keep the, all the communications within the Flink cluster secure. So job manager to task managers, text task managers talking to each other is all done via SSL. And then there's Kerberos support as well, so Flink can authenticate with other systems. Common ones, well, the ones that are supported today out of the box are Kafka, Zookeeper, and Hadoop, which is the three most likely, um, you know, the three most likely subjects that you're gonna wanna talk to. And then there's a way to extend it to further things, but these come out of the box today. So it's important for enterprise application building that you have these things secured. And so in Flink 1.2, we address those things. Okay. This is kind of where I wanted to spend a little more time. This is the idea of these event, advanced event-driven applications. We're gonna talk about process function and queryable state and we're gonna talk about how this allows you to build flexible, stateful, event and time-driven applications. To do this, we're gonna use a motivating example. We're gonna build a simple trading system, okay? This is uh, called Flink Trade. So here are the requirements. We're gonna consume a stream of data, right, from somewhere. This, is, this stream is really just Messages that tell us that the firm that in which Flink Trade runs is um, has taken a position in some equity, right? So it's going to tell us the starting the position we took, the price we paid, and some other data about how long we want to hold this position and how aggressively we might want to try to trade out of it after a certain period of time. So imagine some upstream system made a decision, or someone made a trade, and now we suddenly own a million shares of Google, right? And we want to trade out of this position to our advantage, um, if possible, obviously. So we're gonna, to do this, we're gonna process complex time-oriented trading rules. We are gonna, like I said, trade out of positions to our advantage, if possible. And then finally, we're gonna provide a dashboard of currently held positions to traders and asset managers. So literally, imagine a dashboard that says, these are all the positions the bank holds, this many shares, this is the price we paid, and other data about our current market position. And imagine a trader looking at a screen and there's this dashboard that tells them about all this stuff. 
Um, in terms of the rules, this is a little naive, but it's something we can discuss in a little bit amount of code in a setting like this, but here we go. We're gonna, these are the rules. We're gonna only make trades where the bid price is above our current ask price. That makes sense. The bid price is what someone is willing to pay. The ask price is what we're willing to sell for. So when the bid is higher than the ask, that's a good trade. Um, whenever a trade is made, we're gonna increase our asking price. So looking to optimize our profits. This is a little bit of a you know, super basic, a little bit naive strategy, but basically all I'm saying is that whenever someone's willing to trade with us, we're like, hmm, well, maybe we should just ask a little bit more and see if someone will still trade with us. So our ask price should tick up as trades are being made because we wanna try to find the maximum price we can get for, our, for our, uh, the shares we own. And then finally, we're gonna have a time to live. So positions will have a time to live, let's see, until we try to trade out of them more aggressively by decreasing the ask price over time. So when, it, when we get these, these positions are streamed to us, one of the parameters is gonna be, I want you to hold this position some period of time. After that, I want you to more aggressively try to liquidate this position. So we're gonna start to, at that point, we're gonna start to lower our ask price over time. That's basically it. Those are the things we're gonna build. If you look at it kind of in a diagram, it's gonna look something like this. So you've got quotes. I've used the term quotes and bids sort of interchangeably. So quotes and starting positions. These are two input streams to this trading engine. Uh, notice that the trading engine is gonna maintain some state. That's our current position for all of these equities, right? What, what, what are the positions we hold? And the output, whenever we do make a trade, is gonna send a message to some other system downstream that said, hey, we did in fact make a, made a trade, this is the data, this is the price we traded at, this is how many shares we actually sold. And we're gonna update this state internally from which you could draw, basically it's all the information you would need to like look into the system and see what our positions are. The interesting thing about this is this little gray box internal to um, where it says positions is flink state. The interesting thing about this is we're gonna build this type of application with a dashboard without a database. We're just gonna use flink itself and we're gonna query it from the outside world, sort of like a database. I mean, typical dashboard applications, they make a query, like, get me the latest data. Sometime later they make a query, give me the latest data. We're gonna do exactly that um, and we're gonna just build this dashboard. And we're, just, we're using just flink for all of this. And then of course, we don't wanna just have like, in the real world, this thing gets deployed on a bunch of machines because let's say the input data is the quotes for all the options in the entire option chain. It's a load of data actually. So we're not just gonna run on one or two machines, we're gonna scale across a bunch of machines. And you can sort of think of it like, you know, per, oh yeah, I should mention the following too. The quote stream, the way that you do these kinds of systems when you're joining two streams in something like Flink is the most, the most easy way to do, the easiest way to do this and scale well is to partition the quote stream and the position stream by the same key. So in this case, it's gonna be keyed by symbol, which means that like if you pick the center box there, all of the, all of the quotes for some symbol and all of the positions for some symbol will end up on the same machine. So we can do all of our sort of local state management and joins and lookups all completely locally, right? So you shard the problem on all the input streams by the same key and it naturally lands on the same host and then you do everything local. Um, so you'll see in the code, I'll say key by symbol, that's what I mean. And so then each one of those nodes will handle some portion of all the possible symbols, right? Sort of some portion of the key space. And so you can think of it like, a little state machine partitioned by key, and then these state machines run all over the cluster. Okay, so from here we're gonna look at the code. And hopefully it's reasonably, I think it should be reasonably readable from the back. But this is the main Flink job. You can see, to keep things simple, I'm just gonna read from sockets locally, and I'm gonna enter messages for positions and trade, or for positions and quotes by hand. You'll see me do it. Um, this could just as easily be, 
Kafka or RabbitMQ or any other source, um, any other source of messages, could be the file system, could be anything. It's gonna be sockets for this demo. So we're gonna read from, we're gonna read positions from one stream on some port. Essentially we're going to, this map function is just, think of that as parsing. I'm gonna read a string from input. I'm gonna parse it into a Scala case class called pos position, which is this guy. Symbol, quantity, buying price, ask price, et cetera. All the stuff we wanna track about positions. Um, so this is typical in Flink that you don't work with tuples or something like that. You just work with whatever, whatever types are natural for the application. So the type of this stream is actually a, a data stream of positions, right? So that's that line of code is the parse. This is just something I often do um, if I type, mistype something or there's bad data in Kafka or whatever it is, you wanna like handle that. It's just like a separate thing. Do something with bad data, filter it out, and then key by symbol. Oops. Same thing, this is the quote stream, right? Map, this is all basically the same, parse it, handle bad data, key by symbol, key by the same thing. And then finally, you take the position stream and you connect it to the quote stream and then you call the process function, which is the newer, the newer style API, and that's where we're gonna write our trading engine. But basically this positions connect quotes is exactly uh, that. Whoops, sorry. This is, right? P positions connect quotes visually looks just like that. So you're connecting the two, and then you know you connect them and then you apply some function. That's the trading engine we're gonna write. Okay, so now really the only thing to go, this is, this, this is the whole Flink job skeleton. And then this is the logic for the trading engine. It's also pretty straightforward. Notice this is how you declare state in Flink, whatever that state is. It can literally be anything, it could be some data structure you design, uh, any type at all, but you declare a value state of a type, in our case positions, and via this line of code, I apologize if, if a lot of people in the room have already seen this stuff, but just a quick intro. Um, value state descriptor, basically that, those combination of things there is how you tell Flink what the state is, that it should manage full time. And it really, other than that, the only other um, restriction is it must be serializable, either via some serializer. You can also provide the serializer so it can really be whatever you want. Um, this is a new capability. So basically that's the little magic line of code that says, hey, make this queryable from the outside world and call it that. So external to Flink, some application that's not even running in the cluster can, can make a query, say, Give me position, that could be any name. You provide a key, so the position for some key, and Flink will return you the data, right? That's really what the queryable state API is all about. I'll show you the query side in a second. And that's it, so now we have this position state. And the two, to a connected, a connected process function, which is a co-process function, has two inputs, process, element one and process element two. Not the greatest names in the world, but that's what it is. And um, this one consumes positions, this one consumes bids or quotes. On the position side, we simply update our state with the position information we just read off the stream. And we do this thing with the timer, which I'll come back to. On the bid side or the quote side, same thing, we get our current position right, from Flink State, and we do a simple thing. Um, if it's a good trade, make the trade, and update our position information, right? Makes sense, great trading engine, makes good trades, clearly. So, is good trade is also simple. If we have the inventory and it's a favorable price, that means it's a good trade. Favorable price is just what I said before, bid price is greater than ask price. Have inventory is just what it looks like. It looks at our current position information. Do we have enough shares to sell? And 
that's that. We make a trade. If we make a trade, we update our state, right, our positions. And then finally, the only other thing to really cover is this, um, this timer stuff. So what does this do? This is the piece of code that basically, um, where we said when we get a message, it's going to have some information attached that says, we've taken this position. I only want you to hold it for an hour. And after that, I want you to start aggressively lowering the ask price to try to get rid of it. So we're going to use a timer for that in Flink. So in a real system, you would typically always use event time for this, because then it makes it completely repeatable. You can reprocess the data, get exactly the same thing you got the first time if you like processed historical data. So in a real system, I would change this line of code to say register event time timer. Doing this demo, it's easier because I'm just like kind of adding events to the system by hand. It's easier to do it this way, but the semantics are much stronger the other way, and normally you would always use that. Does that make sense? It's just easier for demo purposes. Like I don't have to come up with timestamps and sort of like push them through in order to advance time. So it makes it easier for the demo. So, but when this timer is called, whoops. So we register the timer and then all the timer really does is it says, give me my per current position, um, update it, take the current ask price, subtract down tick, which is just some small value, and so the price just dropped. And we just do this until someone is willing to trade. Um, and then we register, once we've done that, we register, hey, in another little while, we're gonna do this again. And in another little while, we're gonna do this again until someone will trade with us. And that's basically it. Make sense so far, everyone? And now I'm going to do a demo. We're going to see it running in Flink, and we can kind of play around with it, and then we'll have questions, I think. OK. So first thing is uh, I think I already have a little Flink cluster running locally. Let's check and see. Wow, this screen is really small. <laughs> Let's see. I do have a Flink cluster available. Uh, I started that locally by literally just doing, I'll just, I'll just start over. Okay, now I have no Flink cluster. If I want to run a Flink cluster locally, I do this. Okay, now I want to compile my code. And I'm going to, I'm going to run that code with that command, flink run. You give it a jar file and a class, and it's going to run that job on the flink cluster. So now that should be running. You can see here the running, this screen is way too small to make this useful. But I wanted to show you this. That looks, that's basically flink's rendering of the code we just wrote. It turns it into a data flow graph and executes it. It looks suspiciously like the little diagram that we drew in the, in the slides. So you have ones, the two sources, the connect, and the coprocess function, which is our trading engine. And OK, so we have this thing running. So the other thing I want to do, oh, I want to show you the code for the query side. So the query side, it's a little bit verbose, but there's not really that much going on here. This is just a little program that uses the queryable state interface to talk to Flink. When this happens, what it does is the state's shard all over the cluster, right? Different position information based on keys in different places. It makes a request to essentially the first time, it makes a request to the job manager. The job manager tells the client where all the, who owns which keys in the cluster. That information is cached locally in the client. After that, it just goes straight to individual task managers and says, hey, can I get the state for such and such a key? If that state, if you scale up or down or anything, those kinds of things happen, the state moves, it'll say, the task manager will tell the, the client, that state's no longer available. It'll go back to the job manager, get the latest information about where things are, 
and then it knows where to make queries to. All that's handled transparently in the client library, so you don't have to worry about any of that, um, but that's how it works. But basically to use it, you say, uh, you have to serialize the key, and you have to deserialize the value for it to be meaningful. So you have these serializers for the key and the value. These are just Flink serializers. So if you're familiar with Flink serialization stuff, it's stack, then this is exactly the same code you would use in a normal Flink job to serialize and deserialize things. Um, you can see I'm creating this, the key is a string. The value we're going to get back is a position. So we don't want just raw bytes, but we want to deserialize them into positions. And that's it. Basically, we serialize the key now using that serializer. We make the request. That's the actual line of code that makes the request. Give me the state for this key. Notice it refers to position. And you get a result. You really get a, you get a future back. You wait on that result and then do whatever you want with it. In this case, we're going to draw like a little, we're going to draw that little dashboard I talked about. And so that's this code right here. And to run this, this crazy command, um, whoops, basically I'm just saying invoke this Java program. And notice that the beginning of the line it says watch. Watch is a little command line program, probably a lot of people are familiar with it, but it basically just runs the same thing over and over on some interval. And so I'm going to run this query over and over. And the result is going to be a little dashboard. However, we need more screen space. Wow, that's unexpected. And what happened to my other window? Jeez. I need a third window. Now we're going to do this. Yeah, it's a really tiny amount of screen, real estate. Let's see if we can make this work, though. OK, so there's our program running. We have our query program running as well. Positions coming in. Um, this other stuff is just from the last run. so. Consider the line I'm typing, the first line. So we get information. We're told, hey, let's buy Google. We, or we've bought Google. We bought 10,000 shares. We paid 850 for it. And after 10 seconds, I only want to hold it 10 seconds. After that, I want you to try to trade out of it. So we consume that. We should see our positions update. So you can see now that we own 10,000 shares of Google. The ask price is a little bit higher than what we paid. And after a little while, that ask price is going to start ticking down if we don't start making trades. Let's also, um, same thing. Let's buy 10,000 of Apple, hold it the same amount of time, 10,000 of Twitter, and let's say we'll only hold this for five seconds. Okay. So what we're looking at, there was more screen. That's there is another line there that we can't see, I guess, where the Twitter shares would show up. There they are. OK. So you can see via queryable state, we're sort of peering into the state that's internal to the stream processor, which is a really handy thing. Um, now, the other, other thing we wanted to do was um, make trades. So in this other stream, we're going to try to consume, these are going to be offers to trade. So someone's willing to buy Google, let's say they'll buy 1,000 shares. And the current ask price on our end is 847.80. They're willing to pay 849, and so we'll make that trade. Um, the window we lost was the actual output stream. You would have seen the trade. Let's see if I can get it. Add it real quick. Wow. Uh, sorry. There. All right. So we made that trade. You can see 
the position is for Google. We sold 1,000 shares. The last trade price was the 849. We lost money because we sold it for less than we paid for it. But you get the idea. Someone's willing to buy Twitter. Let's say they'll pay, they'll pay only $12. Um, whoops. 1,000 shares at 12 bucks. We're not going to make that trade. Well, now we will because the price just ticked down. So you can see the trade came out, Twitter, 1,000. We paid $12. We lost a little bit of money, et cetera. So that's basically the trading application. The one other thing I wanted to show you, oh yeah, notice the prices. So right now there's no, there's no data actually streaming, but nonetheless there are interesting op computation going on, right? The, the time-oriented events are still occurring. And so we're still using those triggers to essentially over time adjust our current internal state, right? So that's happening all the time. And then Finally, that's pretty much the application. But one other thing I wanted to show you that's pretty cool and unique to Flink is I want to do something. This is still running. I just quit that little query program, but nothing's changed. The state's still there. If I run it again, we'll see the same state, right? So we see, see the same state as before. Things are still ongoing. One thing I want to do, though, oh, just before I do this. What I want to do is use a save point to take a snapshot of this particular state. Then we could go down, go on and do other things. And we could actually sort of time travel back to this state, right? So we could make these save points every so often. But like next week, if I wanted to see what was going on in my trading system a week ago, because something anomalous occurred, I could actually go back to that state and look at the state of all our positions, look at the input streams, et cetera. So this is a really unique property of Flink that you can sort of make these global snapshots and return to some previous state of the computation. So I just want to note, here we have 9,000 shares of Google, 10,000 of Apple, 9,000 of Twitter at these current, um, all of this state. So we've, we've lost 1,000 bucks in Google, minus 3,000 in Twitter, et cetera. So this is our state that I'm talking about. What I can do is make a, oh, I can make a save point, okay? So that really is a snapshot of all of our internal, inter <laughs> internal state. And I can, I just want to relaunch this dashboard. And I want to change a couple of things. Let's, let's get rid of all this stuff. So someone's, Buy 9,000 shares of Google, fine, I'll pay 50 for it. We just liquidated it, and we'll buy Twitter. Whoops, the rest of it, 9,000 shares, $15, okay? Great, so now our state has changed, right? And this could be a week in the future, the system's just going on. What I wanna show is that we can go back to a previous state and continue. Um, from there or just query it interactively or whatever. So what I'm going to do is say I'm going to cancel the last, the running Flink job. Whoops, shoot. I want this. I want this. Flink run from save point. Um, there. Whoops. Sorry. And then I need this. I'm getting there. Okay. 
runner job from a save point. Now if we go back in and look at it, you can see we'll come up in some previous state. And the system will just be running. So that's literally like imagine you're making save points every week or every day or whatever it is. Say, so, hey, I want to inspect the state of my trading system from two weeks ago at exactly this time. As long as I have a save point from there, I can go back to that time. I can see the state of the system. I can run these interactive queries. And furthermore, it also marks all the offsets. If you're using Kafka or something like that, it marks all the offsets in your input streams as well. So you're literally just going back to that time and you can even proceed forward again and recompute everything. So imagine you changed your code and you have some like new tweak to your algorithm and you could rerun all the data to see if like you got a better result the second time. Those kinds of things are, are possible. So that's pretty much all I have. Yep. You can take any questions if we have any time for it.